My name's Joe Banks and I produce an electronic music and installation art project called Disinformationist. I have an exhibit uh, here at the Freud Museum in London called The Portrait of Jean Genet. It's part of an event called the Festival of the Unconscious, um, which has been set up by the Freud Museum to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the publication of Freud's groundbreaking paper on the unconscious. Uh, as part of this project, we have this installation, The Portrait of Jean Genet. It's based on an interview that the French author, burglar, prostitute, poet and playwright Jean Genet gave to the BBC in 1985, shortly before he died in 1986. Uh, during the interview, he sort of uh, very interestingly um, uh, responds to a question from the interviewer by saying, uh, did you say love? Did you refer to love? Um, vous avez dit l'amour? Because j'ai entendu l'amour. I heard death. You know, the phrase or the sounds, love and death, l'amour and l'amour are virtually identical. Vous avez dit l'amour. J'ai entendu l'amour. 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 You know, in context of the Freud Museum, you know, I think most members of the public are probably familiar with the concept of a Freudian slip, but What's less well known is the extent to which very similar unconscious processes are sort of articulated and revealed through hearing as well as through the actual production of speech. So, you know, the way people hear sounds also reveals something about their unconscious predis predispositions in much the same way that Freudian slips can also reveal something about people's unconscious predispositions. The portrait of Jean Genet installation sort of focuses centrally on this, on a sort of visual metaphor with the so-called Necker cube illusion. It was discovered by the Swiss crystallographer Louis Albert Necker. Uh, you know what you have with the Necker cube is a, is a is a, obviously a cube drawn in three-dimensional space, but it's drawn without perspective. So you know the mind has to make a decision about whether the cube's looking towards you or looking away from you, and your interpretation of that. Um, information can flip inside your own mind spontaneously as you're looking at it. And what you have with the portrait of Jean Genet um, video and sound installation is you know, this analogy between the perceptual inversions produced by looking at the Necker cube illusion and the mishearing that Jean Genet manifested during this interview with the BBC. Um, and it, from my point of view, it forms part of a sort of broader research project. I published a book called Rorschach Audio. Um, Herman Rorschach was a Freudian psychoanalyst who died in 1921. He very famously developed the system whereby, you know, people splash ink on a piece of paper, fold it in two, open it up again, reveal these kind of fantastical, ambiguous, symmetrical figures. The interpretation of this subjective imagery is perceived by um, some psychoanalysts to be a sort of uh, indicator of certain personality traits. The Rorschach audio book and research project uh, explores the ramifications of the analogy between the way people perceive visual images in the Rorschach inkblot test and the way people perceive meanings in potentially or actually ambiguous sounds. Possibly, you know, the Lamour, Lamour mishearing was something that he used as one of his kind of conversational ploys in situations like this. But, you know, undoubtedly it did have really profound resonance with a lot of the imagery in his work and also with his own life experiences. You know, he describes uh, in a section that um, Jean-Paul Sartre quotes from Genet. Um, in Jean-Paul Sartre's book Saint Genet, um, Genet is quoted as having said that you know the association between love and death was kind of inculcated in him um, when he wrote his first poem at the age of 20 on the 10th anniversary of the death of a girl that he'd had been infatuated with when he was 10. There's a little uh, quotation from Sartre's book Saint-Genet, which is um, Genet himself speaking, he says, 
when I wrote poems, the words rose and death flowed together from my pen too often for me to persist in attributing these encounters to chance. There must have been certain forces in my unconscious, complexes, childhood memories, desires, etc., which produced this association so regularly. There must have been, otherwise the fact would not be intelligible. You will object that I know nothing precise about death, but since I've spoken about it so often in a tone of gravity, it is because death must live within me. The proof is that it springs from my slightest word. During the BBC interview, Johnny was sort of famous, famously quite grumpy with the interviewer. I think something happened the day before that had pissed him off because he made some reference to what you said yesterday. So I think they'd had a kind of chat before and had gone badly. <laughs> Vous êtes là. Je suis ici. En ce moment, je me sens à part aussi. J'ai toujours été à part, que ce soit dans nos vents, que ce soit chez vous. Mais est-ce qu'il y avait des moments alors quand vous n'étiez pas à part Non. Jamais dans la vie Non. Même pas avec, je sais pas, quand vous étiez avec quelqu'un, euh, un amour, comme ça, il y avait... Vous croyez que l'homme est toujours seul L'homme, je ne sais pas. Je ne vais pas généraliser. Mais moi, oui. Et ça vous a angoissé Pas du tout. Ce qui m'angoisserait, ce serait qu'il n'y ait pas de distance entre vous et moi. Jean Genet was born in 1910 as the son of a prostitute and uh, his mother gave him up for adoption at the age of about seven months, I think. He was uh, taken care of by a couple of different adoptive families, had a troubled childhood and adolescence, uh, ended up in a reform school for a while, then joined the French Foreign Legion, was dishonorably discharged from the French Foreign Legion for committing the lewd acts and uh, kind of drifted across Europe for some years, um, supporting, himself, supporting himself through burglary and male prostitution, and, you know, various forms of petty crime, you know, before he submitted his first poems for publication and, you know, subsequently published his first book in 1946. Uh, no, pas avec un garçon, avec euh, deux sangs. Qu'est-ce que vous racontez Comme si... <rire> avec deux sangs Ah ouais. Eh, l'un après l'autre. Jeanne was probably one of the most outspoken and sort of direct and explicit portrayers of, uh, you know, gay life in French literature. So, you know, after the publication of his first few novels in 1950, Jean Genet uh, expressed his desire to make a film to a friend of his called Nico Papatakis, who he'd previously been involved, uh, you know, essentially a kind of burglary team, burgling rich households in Paris with his friend Nico Papatakis, who went on to become a nightclub owner, running a club that was popular with a sort of uh, bohemian intelligentsia in Paris in the late 40s and uh, they produced a film together called Un Chant de Mort. The films are very, very stylized, um, you know, beautifully produced, very sexually explicit, homoerotic fantasy. Um, you know, not only is the sexual content, you know, pretty jaw-dropping even by today's standards, but I mean, it was specifically a sort of men in prison film. It's an absolutely incredible scene where these two guys, two prisoners, are in separate cells, are sharing a cigarette by blowing smoke through a tiny hole in the, somebody's drilled in the prison walls through a kind of like two millimeter thick, 10 inch long straw. But I believe it was really intended to be more of a porn film than an art film in its original form. And uh, in context of which, you know, there's a famous story that uh, Princess Margaret uh, attended a special screening of uh, Jean de Moore 
in the company of um, Lord Snowden and a few other notable people. You don't live in France now. You live in... No. The Maroc. But you have a house in Maroc? Vous, restez, vous baladez avec euh, des, des amis, si je peux utiliser ce mot. Non. J'habite l'hôtel. Et pourquoi le, le Maroc Je peux vous poser une question. Et pourquoi pas le Maroc Et pourquoi cette question Parce que vous voulez me transformer encore vous aussi en mythe. You know, the issue of Genet's self mythologization is quite an interesting one because you know the, the stories of the extraordinary lifestyle that brought him to the attention of uh, you know his supporters in the early days of his literary career were you know undoubtedly real. You know, he might have exaggerated bits from here and there, but you know the title of Jean Paul Sartre's book Saint Genet is you know it's like intrinsically putting him on a pedestal as a sort of object of worship, you know, and ironic as that may have been, you know, his reputation sort of led to him experiencing a fair degree of sort of hero worship, I think, from, you know, the people who were interested in his literature, yeah. As he grew older, I think, although I, I can't really say for sure, but I think he really kind of lost interest in writing. He started producing essays, often political essays, getting involved in activist politics and I think he more or less, the impression I get is that he more or less kind of lived off the royalties from his novels and uh, became more distant from his kind of literary reputation as he became more interested in sort of campaigning on social issues. You know, he went to um, America to stay with uh, Black Panthers for three months, campaigned on sort of Palestinian issues, a number of other things like that. So. Uh, I think he got bored of sort of people or frustrated with people sort of building him up to be a kind of heroic figure and he was trying to emphasize that he was essentially a pretty ordinary guy in some respects. You know. Vous voulez qu'on aborde le problème du temps? Je répondrai comme Saint-Augustin à propos du temps. J'attends la mort.